Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Blog Rider podcast. I'm back in the UK. I survived a night in room 217 of the Stanley Hotel. And there's a video for that on YouTube if you want to find out more. And it's time to get this show back on the road. Now, on my travels, I do find it quite amusing that I've just come back from the Mile High City in Denver. And temperatures of minus 13 in the Rockies at 10,000 feet. And yet, this country of mine where I reside, (laughs) I've returned back and it's in mad panic Chaos everywhere because of two inches of snow and temperatures hovering around about the freezing point. Why are us Brits so awful with weather? I mean, the sad news is that we don't get extreme weather like other countries, and we're very fortunate for that. But our media over here seems to hype everything up. And I understand that naming storms in places like the US, where they cause huge devastation... But here in the UK, it seems a little bit like overkill and a little bit of an insult where people over here are searching for snow days and skipping work when on the other side of the world they're getting 10-foot snow drifts and things like that. But hey, what do I know? (laughs) I'm back in the saddle today and I wanted to talk about what goes on behind the scenes in all those big venues that we love. We often enter a stadium or arena and are wowed by giant screens, video streaming and free Wi-Fi in every single seat. But what about the companies that make them all happen? And what about the miles of cables and complex technological infrastructure that we don't see? And what about the traditional trades and how those skills are essential for building those stadiums of the future? And how are those skills evolving? So today I want to speak with the head of Cupertino Electric, which is a private electrical engineering and construction company headquartered in San Jose, California. And it has delivered power and possibilities for more than 60 years. And they're the secret heroes that bring life to life. Cupertino Electric is also one of the largest speciality contractors and is renowned for designing, procuring, constructing, installing, commissioning and maintaining complex electrical systems. Now the company builds these commercial renewable utility and data centre projects for prominent clients in a vast variety of industries. So in this digital age where we talk about tech removing jobs and mass unemployment on the horizon, I wanted to talk about industries that are crying out for workers and those traditional trades. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way back to California so we can speak with John Boncher, President and CEO of Cupertino Electric. So a massive warm welcome to the show, John. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Yeah, hi, Neil. Uh, My name is John Boncher. I'm the President and CEO of Cupertino Electric. We're an electrical contractor, engineering, and manufacturing company headquartered in the Silicon Valley. We're about a billion-dollar company, 3,000 employees across the country. Fantastic. Now, like you said there, it is an electrical engineering and construction company that builds the infrastructure that enables your customers to actually change the world. And you are set to top a billion in revenue this year. But can you help the listeners visualize that how Cupertino is helping those customers with some of those mass-watering projects that you've been a big part of recently. No, you bet. Um, When you think about the most recognized brands globally today, a significant number of them reside here in the Silicon Valley. And we work for every single one of those companies. The the common challenge that they're facing is uh, speed to market, time to market. Uh, They live in a world that's moving at an incredible pace and... The challenge that we face and the benefit that we bring with our value proposition is we can help them figure out ways to do things faster, cheaper, smarter, and safer. So what's your tie to the Silicon Valley's technology industry as well? I think that's something that we should highlight quite early on here. Uh, Well, the company was founded in 1954 by a couple of engineers from Santa Clara University. So they were from day one in the heart of the Silicon Valley had a a kind of a funny introduction to chip manufacturing, and that was our start. And the engineers, because they're engineers, and like any good engineer, they look at a design and immediately start thinking, how can I make it better? In talking with these early chip manufacturers, they realized that we could bring something to them that could really benefit them. And again, even back in those old days, 
time to market was critical. So how are advances in technology actually influencing the way you work over there at the moment? Yeah, I I think some of the, the things that we're seeing with regard to tools and technological advancements, you know, think about 25 years ago, you're going to build a football stadium in the middle of a giant field in Santa Clara. So we happened to do the 49er stadium a couple of years ago. If this was done 25 years ago, surveyors would go out and put survey stakes in the ground. We would then literally take tape measures and measure from those survey stakes and find exact points. So we know there are certain things in a stadium that have to be located in exactly the right spot, like restrooms, uh, the concession facilities. So we would have to go back and it was a painstaking process of measuring off of those survey stakes to make sure that all the work that went in underground, when the football stadium was built up around it, we hit the targets that we needed to hit. Very labor intensive, very slow, and accuracy was not perfect. Fast forward to today, we have GPS tools that allow us to move at an incredible pace, as fast as we can move, and we can pinpoint exact locations in a matter of minutes. I was going to say, presumably, you've also got things like Wi-Fi now and all the cabling and technology infrastructure that also needs to go into those plans, doesn't it, quite early on? Oh, with it, yeah, within the buildings, it's staggering what we see today. Yeah. And again, uh, I think the 49er Stadium is a perfect example. The amount of data cabling that went into that facility is mind-boggling, and you've got uh, Wi-Fi connections the NFL wants teams to have Wi-Fi connections and be able to access video online. Uh, the amount of da- data that moves through that facility is mind-numbing. And, w- and we had to handle both the uh, electrical power, so power for the lights, the scoreboard, the speaker systems, and then all the data cable that went to the TVs, all the different monitors, the, the data ports inside at every chair, at every seat in the stadium. It's a these buildings today have a lot of technology packed into them. They really do. And it's the skilled work trades that I think we often forget about that make a lot of it possible. I mean, I've got to ask, do you think that the tech industry could actually learn a lot from the U.S. skilled work trades, uh, for example? Well, I am I am not an expert in the tech industry, but yeah. what I will tell you that I've seen for the last almost 30 years work beautifully are apprenticeship programs. Yeah. And I, in my career, uh, I was uh, the beneficiary of a quasi-apprenticeship program when I started here almost 30 years ago. And along my path, I was always teamed up with somebody who was responsible for helping me understand how the business worked real time. So I had a college education. I had a background in economics, which brings zero value when you're an electrical contractor. Um, But I understood basic business principles. And then throughout my education here at Cupertino Electric, I was always teamed with somebody. And and that same structure, uh, the apprenticeship model is what's used in union construction apprenticeships. And it's a fantastic model. So the, the student will go to school at night and learn theory, and they'll learn how to use the tools and material. And then the next day, they'll go to work and practice what they learned the night before. So it's a absolutely textbook way of learning and i think tech i think all companies could benefit from that model now you have enjoyed fantastic success and deservedly so too but what are the major challenges that you're facing in your industry at the moment well the single biggest challenge we have is a shortage of skilled workers yeah and it we see it across the country and in my opinion based on yeah, you know, I'm in a fortunate position because we do work across the country with almost 3,000 people. I have certain visibility into, into certain things. And I will tell you right now that there is a significant shortage. It is getting worse by the month. And with some of the infrastructure projects that have been proposed by the administration, I can honestly say I don't know how it will all get done because we have done a very poor job of attracting young people into the construction trades, into the skilled trades, and baby boomers are retiring and they're being replaced with fewer and fewer people. The problem, the gap is only gonna get bigger.
Now, speaking of those young people there, and we've probably got a few listening to us talk right now. I mean, how do you think millennials and the Gen X folks listening uh, that are looking into skilled trade work will be impacted by that tech fueled workforce? And how also, how important is tech literacy for skilled workers too? Because I think that's something we don't hear enough about, is it? We just we kind of separate the two, but they are com- combining more and more now. Well, I think tech literacy for anyone today is important. Yeah. When I look at the the people in the construction industry, so much of what we're doing is incorporating technology, and it's out of demand. If we have fewer employees available to hire, and we have more work than we've ever had before, something has got to change with the way, with the means and methods that we use. And I will honestly tell you, nine out of ten of the new productivity saving ideas we have come up with in the last few years involve some form of technology all the way to uh, we're, we're testing something right now that's proprietary and very early on, but we're looking at using different devices to measure crew productivity based on motion. And we can then tell, we can get an idea of crew productivity. We can understand the degree to which tasks have become repetitive and do we need to rotate people so we don't see soft tissue injuries. We can look at uh, significant changes in productivity patterns, which could tell us that there's a site condition that's changed. You know, really exciting stuff. And it's, it's, a, it's technology that 10 years ago I would have never imagined was possible. So how do you think this burgeoning need for tech literacy will actually impact young kids looking to get into skilled trade work? Or do you think that kids are just going to have that tech literacy as standard now? Because I think they, they can't remember a time before an iPhone or before an iPad, can they? Well, yeah, you're right. And I, you know, I've got two young ones at home and I will tell you, they pick up an, a device today and they immediately jump on and start using it where I look at it and I want to read an instruction manual. Uh, so I think, you know, they're natives. They've grown up with it. They understand it. The kids that are, and and I, I'll, maybe I'll answer your question a little differently. If I think about young people and I put them into two categories, just for this example, and let's say one category are young people that want to go to college. The second category is young people that don't want to go to college. For young people that don't want to go to college, any vocational trade is a fantastic avenue. And those young people, when they are technology natives, when they do understand how to use technology and how it can benefit them them as individuals and the companies that employ them, they'll have opportunities to help invent things. And we've had guys figure out ways of using drones and we fly over and measure productivity rates and look at site conditions on these giant solar PV fields. We've built some of the largest solar PV facilities in the country. You know, you'll be installing panels on a site that's five miles long where the curvature of the earth makes it impossible to see the other end of the site. We'll fly these drones. These drones will give us information that we can download into applications and start understanding what's happening today with regard to productivity. We can measure impacts of heat, wind, uh, working six days as opposed to five, and we're gathering phenomenal data. And these things were invented by young people who have grown up with technology and are out in the field and saw the need and came up with the idea. Now, you did say a few moments ago that we don't do enough to attract young people into the trade field there. But I'm convinced a lot of people listening would have no idea that that kind of drone technology, for example, actually exists in that in that uh, trade industry. So can you bust some other myths about trade work in the US in particular that young people may have about trade work and uh, and actually what the future actually entails in that industry? Yeah, Neil, great question. Um you know, and these myths are, they're, these perceptions, they're outdated. They're completely wrong. Things like low salaries, uh, scarce opportunities for work, long periods of unemployment, uh, conditions are unsafe. You know, essentially that, that uh, a career in the skilled trades is a career of last resort. And, and those are absolutely as far from the truth as can be. You know, we, we look at salary ranges. Uh, we did a piece not too long ago where we cited uh, a journeyman electrician who works in San Francisco, makes $128,000 a year. 
So that's not a low salary. Uh, scarce opportunities. Um, I will tell you right now, there's over 200,000 skilled trades jobs unfilled across the United States today. Uh, when you look at Manpower's Talent Shortage Survey, the number one, the the, 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 uh, the job type that is in greatest demand, where there is the greatest shortage, are skilled trades. Um, it's there's the the opportunities are plentiful. Peer, long periods of unemployment. Back in the old days, that was true. There were there were seasonality issues. O over time, with weather predictions, with the way we schedule our work, with the advent of labor-saving tools, we can get a tremendous amount done to get a building ready for winter. So when winter comes, we're working inside. So that's not true. The the myth that the trades are unsafe. Over the years, again, a lot of it has been regulated. Uh, regulations have forced people to do things differently. Companies are hyper aware of the need to work safe. Our tools and our uh, personal protective equipment, the use of Kevlar um, has has created, uh, has made gigantic strides in safety. I, I have a friend that worked uh, early in his career. So this is 40 years ago. Uh, on a tunneling operation. And back in those days, it was widely known that there would be one fatality per mile building a tunnel. Today, when you hear that, it, it's completely unfathomable. It can't happen. It, it's just mind boggling. Yet 40 years ago, it was completely accepted. So 40 years is a long time. But when you think about the magnitude of that change to where today we would not accept that, no one would enter into that type of work. Uh, the, the strides that the industry has made with regard to safety are pretty impressive. And I, so it, it, in the long run, I, I, I think what young people need to understand, and it's as probably more so their parents than the actual uh, young, young people that are out there, more so than the educators. I met with a bunch of teachers uh, when I got interested in this topic. And I got interested in this topic, quite honestly, I'll digress for a second. My brother, my middle brother, is a perfect example of somebody who did not want to go to college and in our family. And I think in society in general, back in those days and today, you know, it was expected that we would get good grades and go on to college. And I have uh, three other siblings. Three of us went to college. Uh, my middle brother had no interest in going to college and he was pushed in that direction and it didn't work out well. And I think if he were given opportunities like the opportunities exist that exist today to help people find a path, find a way to get to college. If he was given those same opportunities and shown the different vocational paths that he could have taken, I think he probably would have had a very different life. And I think that's true with a lot of kids that are out in the world today. And I think it's something that needs to be communicated. The educators, when I started talking to teachers, I thought it was simply we need to get to counselors and teachers. And without exception, every single one of them said counselors and teachers can be brought up to speed with a lot of the changes that have happened. That would be great, but it's going to do nothing unless you can sway the opinion of the parent. And that's really what needs to be focused on today. I do wonder if we are going to come full circle here because the rise of AI and automation is famously or a lot of people believe is going to remove a lot of the white collar jobs and middle management because they're no longer needed. And actually having a trade, that's going to be a highly desired and something that could actually protect your future rather than one of those jobs that can just be automated and or outsourced. Yeah, I would, I would uh, tend to agree with you. I think there's a couple of things that uh, when we think about the skilled trades, that we'll need to remember is even if we are manufacturing things completely with machines and someday we get to a point where robots are doing the work, there's somebody who's going to be in there telling the robot what to do and understanding how the whole thing has to go together. That's a skilled tradesperson. The other thing I would say, and there's been a lot of talk about prefabricated building structures and, uh, you know, you would go online and at some point uh, figure out exactly what you want and you would hit enter and a building would arrive on your doorstep six months later. I, I think there are opportunities where that will happen. But when I think about the way, especially we look at Silicon Valley, the way companies use their buildings, the building helps define that company's culture. 
and the degree with which they go to make their building special and different, I can't imagine that's going to go away. These buildings are custom made 100% by hand, never done before in the history of man. And that is going to drive the need to have skilled tradespeople. So what's next for Cupertino? Is there anything else that you can share with us today about what you're working on? Well, we are doing a lot of exciting things in the utility industry. Uh, our utility infrastructure has tremendous opportunities for upgrade. When we think about the amount of power that the country uses today relative to 10 years ago, uh, the increases are staggering. The challenges that the utility industry faces with the advent and the and the rapid adoption of solar PV have created all kinds of challenges for the utility industry. So there's a lot of opportunities in the utility uh, in the utility space. It's a very expensive segment to get involved in. It's very very difficult work, but that's exactly what our company uh, is attracted to. We're doing a lot of stuff in the Midwest with manufacturing. Uh, at some point this year, we will have fully utilized over a half a million square feet of manufacturing space. And we'll be busting at the seams looking for more square footage. And we're going to continue to push down that path. And that's in direct response to our customers' ever-growing need for speed, uh, quality, and cost savings. So again, it's a it's an idea we love, and it's something that's being pushed on us by these tech companies. Well, a huge thanks for coming on the show today. But before I do let you go, can I just ask that you remind the listeners of how they can find out more information or equally contact a member of your team if they have any questions based on our chat today? Because I'm quite conscious there may be a few young people listening that are wanting to investigate their options of getting their own trade or, or skilling up and not knowing where to turn. Well, that'd be great, Neil. We've got. A, I'll give you a couple of addresses. Info at CEI, Cupertino Electric, Inc., CEI.com. You can go to www.cei.com, and then you can hit any of the social media properties, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. We're on all those. Fantastic. Well, a huge thanks for coming on today. I really appreciate you actually educating the people listening today on the, the numerous career options they have. And you equally busted more than a few myths out there. And I think it, in these age of AI and automation, it's never been more important to have skills, to have those human soft skills too, but also have a trade behind you. And I think that's a, in many ways it's been a dying art and it, do, it shouldn't be and it's something we should protect and uh, move forward with so a big thank you for coming on and sharing that story with us today my pleasure neil thanks for giving me the opportunity we constantly hear about how technology is removing jobs but it's so important to hear john talk about the traditional trades and how they're crying out for workers skills are being lost as each year passes and very very well-paid jobs are sitting empty and it's also important to highlight there that there's a huge tech element to these roles now too and disillusioned kids can actually get themselves a great career by learning a trade. It's funny how we come full circle, isn't it? I do wonder that when those cushy office jobs do slowly become automated over the next few years, if we see that the trade industry begins to pick up again. But what are your thoughts about our conversation with John today? I mean, Have people been looking down on trades when actually they should have been looking up at those create and build our critical infrastructure and the places that we like to hang out. As always, let me know by tweeting me at Neil C. Hughes, emailing me at techblogwriter at outlook.com and don't forget to pop by my site which is techblogwriter.co.uk slash podcast if you want to listen to any of the episodes that we've released as we race up to episode 500. But I'm going to go have a little nod in the chair like an old man and get rid of this jet lag once and for all. And I'll return next week with a load of episodes. We've got so many great guests queued up. So hopefully you can join me then. So a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.